Hello. Okay, welcome back. So I am reading. Um, I am reading from Rediscovering the Kingdom by the late great Dr. Miles Monroe. I am on chapter one. The title of chapter chapter one is Discovering the Origin and Purpose of a Man. This may come in two parts because this chapter is kind of lengthy. Um, it says there's no greater pursuit of man than the pursuit for power to control our circumstances. All right, um, I, this is page 23 of the book. You know, if you have the hard copy and you're just on my hand, and I'm going to go ahead and read um, until I stop. All right. It was five o'clock in the morning and I had not slept all night. I was nervous and anxious. It was the big day. Time for the test. I dreaded. It was a memorable day during my years at the university. I had studied all night and faithfully read all my notes, books, and reviews. It was my final biology test. The focus of this class was the human anatomy. At the end of the test, I felt confident that I had done well. Three days later, I was proven right when my professor called me in to congratulate me for receiving the top grade in the class. I was so proud of myself and I felt I had achieved something outstanding. As I stood there looking at the papers he handed me, I suddenly realized something. I had never thought of. Throughout this course of study, I have become well-educated in the knowledge of the human body, the names, purposes, and functions, all of its intricate parts and organs. The thought that struck me was that I knew what the human body was, but did not know why the human body was. In other words, I knew the product, but I didn't know its purpose. This youthful discovery still motivates me today. There are over 6 billion people on planet Earth and only a few of them know why they exist. What a tragedy. What is man? Why was man created? Why was he put on this planet? What is he to do? Where did he come from? What can he do? Where is he going? These questions strike at the heart of all human pursuit. All that, may, all that men want to know are the answers to these questions. All humans simply are humans simply a link in some evolutionary chain as proclaimed by the theologians of evolution. Are we simply sophisticated primates? participating in the drama of the survival of the fittest? Are we simply a freak accident of some cosmic big bang mishap from which we emerge from the slime of some cosmic soup as the magnificent reasoning self-conscious being to which we have evolved today? I find it impossible to believe that anyone could believe such a theory. This unreasonable, unsubstantiated, unproven theoretical proposition has no foundation in truth and desecrates the truth of man's origin. It dilutes and diminishes his glorious purpose. Man is the crowning act of an intentional creator. He exists as God's co-regent in a world created for him. In examining mankind, we will discover the beauty and the mystery of God's purpose for the whole of creation. It seems that the end of all things will be discovered in the beginning of all things. Therefore, we begin our study by considering God's original plan for his creation. Quite obviously, if we seek to understand the creation, we must first understand the creator because the original purpose of any product is only in the mind of the creator of that product. Therefore, to discover the purpose and reason 
for mankind's creation and existence, we must attempt to tap into the mind of his creator. After all, no one knows the product like the manufacturer, the origin of the first kingdom. First, it is essential to understand that before anything was, God is. The word God denotes self-existing one or self-sufficient one and describes a being that needs nothing or no one to exist. Therefore, God is not a name, but rather a description of a character. Because of who and what he is, he alone qualifies for the title of God. This totally independent God existed before all things and began his creative process by first producing the entire invisible world, which we also have come to know as the supra or above natural world. This act of creation initiated the concept of ruler and rulership as the creator became the governor over a created realm. Another word for ruler is king. God called this invisible realm or domain heaven and thus he became the king over the domain heaven. This was the beginning and creation of the first kingdom called the invisible kingdom of God. This was also the introduction of the concept of kingdom. This concept of kingdom is critical, essential, necessary, required, and imperative in order to understand, appreciate, and comprehend the purpose, intent, goal and, and objectives of God and mankind's relationship to him and the creation. Divine motivation for creation. It is not unreasonable to ask why God, the king of heaven, would want to create sons in his image and a visible universe. Was he not satisfied and pleased with an, with an invisible realm of angels and powers to rule? I believe the answer to this question lies in understanding the very nature of God himself. This is much about, there's much about this great, awesome, self-sustaining one that we do not, cannot, and may never know. But he has revealed enough of himself to mankind to allow us to glimpse, to glimpse some of the magnificence of his nature and character. One such characteristic is that God is love. First John four, verse 18 and verse 16. Please note that he does not say that he has love, but that he is love. This is an important this is an important distinction when it comes to understanding his motivation because if God is love then his actions would naturally or supernaturally be the manifestation of the nature of love one of the obvious qualities of love is that love has to give and share itself if this be so then the very nature of God would be to desire to share his rulership and government. In essence, love is fulfilled when it gives and shares itself. It is this inherent nature of love that motivated the king of heaven to create spirit children called mankind to share his kingdom rulership. In other words, man was created for the purpose of rulership and leadership. This is why in the message of Jesus, when he described the age of the kingdom of God and its provision for man, he indica his indication was that the kingdom belonged to man 
before earth was created. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. Matthew 25, verse 34. It was God's idea to share his invisible kingdom with his offspring, which he called mankind, and to give them his nature and characteristics. The concept of colonization. There's another concept that is crucial to understanding the original purpose and plan of God for man and creation. And this is the thought that has come to be known to man as colonization. Colonization is a process whereby a government or ruler determines to, determines to extend his kingdom, rulership, or influence to additional territory with the purpose of impacting that territory with his will and desires. The principle of colonization is, understand, is understood in the process of transforming and extending territory to be just like the center of government from which it extended. That is, to manifest the nature and will of the ruler in the lifestyle, actions, activities, and culture of the territory. Therefore, the foundation for appreciating God's creative motivation is to understand that his intent was to share his governing authority with his spirit children by extending his visible heavenly kingdom to a visible earthly realm for the purpose of colonizing that domain to be like heaven. Genesis 1.1 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, the physical universe. God ruled as king over a spacious and spectacular spiritual realm that he had already created. It was a world filled with angels who were there to serve him and worship him. The book of Genesis opens with God's authority in the creation of the physical world that would be the environment for the manifestation of his eternal purpose. His intention was to establish his kingdom in the physical world without having to come visibly into that world himself. The purposes of the invisible God would be to serve would be served by a visible creation that was the result of his creative genius this plan would be carried out by creating from his own spirit being from his own spirit being a family of offspring who would be just like him created in his exact image as his representatives, they would release, establish, and implement his invisible kingdom in the visible, natural world. This is his original purpose for creating man. It was not an accident. It was not a fluke. It came about through the planning and preparation of the great God of heaven, whom through his love and wisdom constructed his awesome plan. Man was right there in the center of the plan. From the very beginning, God's plan for mankind centered in the fact that God desired to have a personal relationship with man and vice versa. It was never God's plan to establish a religion. As stated earlier, religion is a result of man's response to a deep spiritual vacuum in the recesses of his soul for something he cannot describe or identify. The word religion denotes belief systems, creeds, and adherence to faith or convictions. These systems are manifested in the development of an array of traditions, rituals, and cultural practices that extend from the simple to the very complicated. 
Every civilization throughout history cultivated forms of religion that sustained their viability as social entities and served as an outlet to address the mystical questions of life and death. For many, religion has been and continues to be a tireless preoccupation distract, distracting them from the unresolved fears of the human heart. The need for a religion in some form is a universal, universal, universal phenomenon and is inherent in the human spirit. All humankind left to themselves will inevitably develop some form of religious practice. In many incidences, this can take the shape of systems of philosophies, theories, ideolo ideologies, a set of principles, or documented convictions. Whatever the form, whatever the form takes, the purpose is the same. The attempt to satisfy the indescribable spiritual craving in the spirits of all mankind. It is interesting to note that in the ancient writings of the Hebrew prophet and patriarch Moses, who chronicles the creation narrative of the physical universe and mankind, we do not find the establishment of a formal religious system or code of tradition for man to follow or practice. The birth of the kingdom, the spirit of dominion. The most powerful motivation in the heart of man is the pursuit of power. Why is the desire to control our environments and circumstances so overpowering to humanity? The answer is found in the very nature and heart of the human spirit. Man was created to exercise power and designed to manage it. The motivating purpose for the creation of the human species was to dominate the earth and its resources. The result of the creator's desires to extend his rulership from the supernatural realm to the physical realm. His plan and program was to do this through a family of, a sp of spirit children. He would call his sons. The record of this creative act is found in Genesis 1, 26. It says, then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over, have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and all and all the creation and all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his image, in his own image, and in the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Genesis 1, 26 through 27. This statement is the first declaration of God's intent for you and me and encompasses the total purpose assignment, potential, passion, and design of man as an entity. This statement is the key to man's natural desires, sense of purpose, and fulfillment in life. There are a number of critical principles embedded in this first mission statement of God concerning man's creation that must be carefully examined. Man was both created and made. Both of these words are important and are distinctively different in the orig original Hebrew language. The word created is from the Hebrew word bara, which means to create from nothing. And the word make is from the Hebrew word asa, which means to form from something that is already created. Therefore, man is the integration of parts that were created from nothing and things that were already made. This mystery describes the production of man's spirit being directly from the spirit of God, thus making man a composite of the nature, attributes, 
and characteristics of his source, which is God, the creator himself. This truth is critical when discussing the spirit of dominion in mankind. It is also note noteworthy at this point to understand that the word for source in the original Hebrew is the word Abba, which we translate as father. This is why God is considered the father of all mankind. He sourced us all and thus we possess his nature and likeness. Number two, man was made in God's image. The word image here is not referring to physical likeness, but is translated from the Hebrew word teslim and demut, both meaning essential nature, copy, characteristics, and essence. This denotes that man as a spirit being is an expression of God's moral and spiritual nature and his attributes make him God-like and place him above and beyond all earthly creation. In essence, man was created by God in the God class and was given the responsibility to exercise that quality as God's agent on the earth. Number three, God created man. The word man is important because it does not refer to gender as in male, but was the name given by the creator for the species of spirits that came out of his spirit. In essence, man is plural in tense and was the name given to the spirit species. It is also essential to note that spirits have no gender and thus man, neither male nor female, but pure spirit. The creator said, let them have dominion over the earth. This statement is most critical and contains the secret to the transfer of power and authority from God to man, from heaven to earth, and from the unseen to the seen world. This is the foundation of divine delegation of responsibility for management and rulership over the earth to man. This is significant because the nature of God's holiness and integrity does not allow him to violate his own words. Thus, when God spoke these words, he established the conditions of his relationship to each through mankind. He did not say, let us have dominion over the earth as they would have given, as that would have given him legitimate access to earth without reference to mankind. But by these words, he established mankind as the only legal authority on earth with the power of attorney to act on his behalf. Perhaps this is why God has never done anything earth in, on earth without the cooperation of a human entity and was ultimately the reason for the necessity of his entrance into the human race as a man. Consequently, Jesus the man made Christ the God legal on earth. Jesus, the man, made Christ the God legal on earth. This is the power mankind has on planet earth. Let, number five, let them have dominion. This is the most fundamental principle for understanding the nature and the desires of mankind. Here, the creator expresses clearly, emphatically, why he created man. This statement leaves no doubt as to what motivated his creating, his creating man and, and his expectation, man's, this statement leaves no doubt as to what motivated his creating man and his expectation, man's behavior. 
It also establishes, establishes man's assignment and the standard of success for his existence. This word dominion lays the foundation for the kingdom concept as it relates to God's purpose and plan for the human species. Over, number six, over the fish of the sea, birds of the air, the livestock, earth, and all that creep upon the ground. This statement is crucial as it defines the nature and boundaries of the rulership of mankind. It is essential to note that the human entity is not included in the context of man's dominion. The implication is that God, the creator, never intended man to rule over or dominate his own kind, but rather to rule the creation and resources of the earth. What is dominion? In the arts of human communication, it is understood that successful communication is only possible when the terms and the concepts used between the subject and the object of the communication are the same. Therefore, before we proceed any further in this most important discussion and exploration of the kingdom concept, it is necessary for us to have a fundamental understanding of the root of this concept of dominion as it pertains to the kingdom concept. The creator's first declaration of man's purpose for his creation is hidden in the word dominion. And for man to understand himself and his purpose, it is imperative that the word be thoroughly understood. The words dominion or rule are synonymous and derive their meaning from the same root words. The Hebrew words for which the concept of kingdom dominion comes are rendered mashal, mamlaka, Malkut, and the Greek derivative is the word basilia or basilia. The definition of these words include to rule, sovereignty, to reign, kingdom, to master, to be king, royal rule, and kingly. The term mamlaka also signifies the area and the people that constitute a kingdom. It is important to note that the concept of king was also considered the embodiment of kingdom. The king was viewed as the symbol of the kingdom proper and personified the glory of the kingdom. Therefore, the definition of dominion can be crafted in the following way. To be given dominion means to, uh, to be established as a sovereign, kingly ruler, master, governor, responsible for reigning over a designated territory with the inherent authority to represent and embody as a symbol, the territory, resources, and all that constitutes that kingdom. This definition should be memorized, understood, and embraced by the spirit of man if we are to understand the original purpose and will of God, our creator, for our existence. With that understanding, we can appreciate the gravity of the first proclamation of God, the creator, concerning mankind. Man was created with a dominion mandate over earth, giving him responsibility for representing the kingdom government of God on earth. Mankind is heaven's earthly agency for kingdom rulership influence. Mankind is intended to embody the nature of God on earth and serve as his divine representatives in the physical world. The creation and commissioning of man was the first introduction and establishment of the kingdom of heaven on earth. Kingdom of kings. It is also vital to apprehend that God's design for heaven's earthly kingdom is totally distant, 
distinct, I'm sorry, from the from the structure and ideology of earthly kingdoms established by men. The proclamation by the creator in Genesis 126 for man to have dominion over all the earth was given to the entire species of, ma species of mankind, both male and female. This is the fundamental precept as it renders all mankind rulers or kings in the earth. In fact, this mandate further establishes the creator's intent for mankind to rule over, to, to, to mankind to rule not over one another, but to exercise their royal sovereignty as a corporate kingship responsible to master, govern, rule, control, and manage the earth and its resources. Therefore, all mankind is created rulers and kings. Mankind is a kingdom of kings. Perhaps this is why, as we will discuss later in this book, Jesus is designated king of kings in the culmination of his redemptive work. This concept is also echoed in the word of God to the entire nation of Israel through Moses when they were released from the oppression of the kingdom of Egypt under Pharaoh. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my, co and keep my covenant, then out of all nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. Exodus chapter 19, verse 5 through 6. The intent of the original kingdom, the intent of the establishment of God's original kingdom of kings was to extend his rulership, will, and nature from heaven to earth. His desire was to manifest his glorious character, wisdom, righteous, righteous judgments and purposes in the earth realm through the administrative leadership of mankind on earth. Man was created with the gifts and divine nature to execute God's will in the earth. The ultimate goal of God, the creator, was to colonize earth with human, with with heaven and establish it as a visible territory of an invisible world. His purpose was to have his will done and his heavenly kingdom come on earth just as it is in heaven. A few years ago, I'm sorry, the loss of a kingdom. A few years ago, I watched a television documentary on the mystery of lost civilization and city. The narrator led us through tales of a number of well-known myths and legends, such as the lost city of Atlantis and the ruins of the Mayan civilization. I was intrigued as he presented artifacts, documents, and an array of evidence attempting to construct his argument in such a way as to prove his case. As I sat there engrossed in this presentation, I could not help but think of a similar story of the very first lost kingdom, the kingdom of Adamic, Adamic kings. When God created man, please note that the first thing he gave him was his image and likeness. But the first mandate and assignment he gave man was dominion. Let's carefully consider the nature of this dominion mandate as recorded in Genesis 1, through 28 and its implications as to what man's original rulership did and did not involve. God gave man dominion over earth. God gave man do dominion over creation and earth, not other men. God never gave man dominion over heaven. God never gave man a religion, but a relationship. God never promised man heaven, but earth. To understand the loss of the Adamic kingdom mandate, it is 
Important to realize you cannot lose what you never had. Adam, the first royal representative of heaven's kingdom on earth, was delegated the responsibility of serving as heaven's earthly ambassador. An, amb an, ambassadorial, rep an ambassadorial representative is only as viable and legal as his relationship with his government. Therefore, the most important relationship the first man, Adam, had on earth was with heaven. This is why the Holy Spirit of God was intimate with mankind from the beginning. His indwelling presence guaranteed constant communication and fellowship with the will, mind, intent, and purposes of God and heaven so that he could execute his government's will on earth. This, this relationship made the Holy Spirit of God the most important person on earth and established him as the key component of the kingdom of heaven on earth. The loss or separation of man from the Holy Spirit of God would render mankind disqualified, would render mankind a disqualified envoy of heaven on earth for he would not know the will or mind of the government of heaven for earth. As we read the Genesis record of the encounter of mankind with the adversary, the devil in chapter three, we see that the goal of the attack was to drive man from the garden of relationship with God and heaven, resulting in the loss of the kingdom of heaven on earth. An act of treason. Perhaps the greatest crime committed in any kingdom or nation, ancient or modern, is the crime of treason. As a matter of fact, it is the only crime to which there is no question of receiving the death penalty. It is the ultimate act of betrayal. When a government confers on any citizen the authority and right to represent its interests, it has given the greatest form, it has given the greatest form of trust possible and should be esteemed as the highest of honors. The higher the, the higher the representation, the greater the responsibility and trust, and thus the greater the influence can have in one's nation or kingdom. This is especially critical in the context of kingdoms where the king not only represents himself, but embodies and symbolizes the entire kingdom and all it constitutes. Adam, in essence, embodied heaven's government on earth. Therefore, the fall of man was not just a personal act of disobedience, but was, essential, but was essentially an act of treason. Adam and his descendants committed the ultimate act of betrayal, deserving the penalty of death. In effect, Adam declared independence from his kingdom government, the empire of heaven, and in, and in so doing, severed his relationship with the king of heaven, abandoned his position as ambassador and losing his dominion over earth. Through adaptation of his responsibility as king over earth, Adam lost the most important relationship of all, the Holy Spirit. Through violation of God's word, mankind was rendered a disqualified representative of heaven on earth. When Adam fell through this act of treason, he did not only lose his personal relationship with his heavenly father, but he lost a kingdom. Adam became an ambassador without portfolio, an envoy without official status, a citizen without a country, a king without a kingdom, a ruler without a dominion. Jesus. All right, we're going to pause right there and I will pick up in the next recording. I'm on page 34. The next recording, I will be starting at A Kingdom Promised. Thank you.